Good afternoon, and welcome to the 100 Women Project's Women's History Month Lecture with Dr. Heidi Weber. I'm Stan Kula, Executive Director of the Foundation for Sussex County Community College. The 100 Women Project is part of the College Foundation, which raises funds to support the students of Sussex County Community College. This initiative was established in 2013 with the goal of garnering pledges from 100 women in the business and professional communities in order to endow scholarships for non-traditional aged women students returning to school, especially those after the interruption in their education for any reason. Thanks to all the members of the 100 Women Project for their generous support, and a special thanks to our corporate sponsors, First Energy Foundation, Lakeland Bank, and the Selective Insurance Group Foundation, who made this program possible. For those of you who haven't yet made your gift and wish to do so, please visit www.sussex.edu slash 100 women to make your gift online. The link will be provided in the chat throughout our program. Following today's lecture, you will have the opportunity to ask Dr. Weber a question during our Q&A period, so be sure to submit your questions by typing them into the chat. In addition, you'll also hear from Christina Miller, a Sussex County Community College graduate who received one of the first 100 Women Project scholarships in 2015. There will be an optional half hour of virtual networking following the event where you'll be able to meet the other guests. But before we begin, it is my great honor to introduce the founder of the 100 Women Project and a member of the Foundation's Board of Directors, Judge Lorraine Parker. Good afternoon, everyone. Before I introduce Dr. Weber, I want to just briefly expand upon the 100 Women Project that uh, Stan just told you about. Uh, we uh, are now in our eighth year, and we have provided dozens of scholarships to women returning to college after their in education was interrupted. The project was designed for 100 women to contribute $100 a year to fund the scholarships. The membership was not limited, however, to 100 people or to just women. We have male members who have joined on behalf of their wives, their daughters, their mothers, or themselves. The project has been so successful that in the last few years, we were able to award 10 scholarships. The project has continued, and we have heard over and over from people who have received the scholarship assistance. And they have talked about how it has enhanced their confidence, their self-worth, in addition to their economic standing in the marketplace, because they have had the opportunity to complete their education and to go forward with what they intended to do. We hope that you will continue to support the 100 Women Project, and if you are not yet a member, that you will join us. Now I am pleased today to present a proud daughter of Sussex County. Dr. Heidi Weber, as the keynote speaker of our 101st celebration of the 19th Amendment, guaranteeing women the right to vote. Women's suffrage was a hard-fought campaign that began in 1848, before the Civil War, and continued through World War I. In 1920, the 19th Amendment was finally adopted and became an integral part of the United States Constitution. Dr. Weber is the first and only woman faculty member on the Global Studies Department at SUNY Orange. SUNY, as you all know, is the State University of New York. She earned her doctorate in 19th century American history, but she has expanded her interests and recently did a history of the Holocaust recording all oral histories from survivors and liberators for the Holocaust Remembrance Center at the university. She is currently working on campus to help prevent gender-based harassment and discrimination. 
Lest anyone think Heidi is all academic all the time, she enjoys old school rap and hip hop music when she's exercising. When she's driving to work, she prefers music, rock music from the 80s and 90s. She likes good food, and if she had a choice of any menu item, she would choose eggplant parmesan. It's a good chase, a choice, I like that. She loves animals, and her secret dream is to rescue abused dogs and cats and give them loving homes. Her three favorite uh, people in American history are General William Tecumseh Sherman, who helped hasten the end of the Civil War, Alexander Hamilton, who as everybody knows is Lin-Manuel Miranda's alter ego, and Mary Walker, a slave from North Carolina who escaped from slavery on a trip to Philadelphia. Heidi has a lifelong love of earning, uh, learning, and she loves to share that with her students. Today, she will share her extensive knowledge of the history of the women's suffrage movement with us. Dr. Weber. Good afternoon. First and foremost, I'd like to thank Judge Parker. It was truly an honor for me to be introduced by a woman that I admire. I hold her in high esteem, and I've had the luck of knowing her for a few years in my life. Thank you so much for having me here today. I'd also like to thank Stan and, of course, Christine for all their wonderful work. It's just amazing. And, of course, Dr. Connolly, the president of Sussex County Community College. Quote, I was induced to offer a vote first because I felt it a duty and second, out of curiosity. I wanted to know how men did behave at the polls. We've always been told that it was a dangerous place, one where it would not be safe for a woman to make her appearance, that the atmosphere at the polls was freighted with pollution for women. I feel stronger, wiser, and better for having come in contact with the political influence of last Tuesday at the polls. My fears were groundless as the men whom I there met were quiet and well-behaved. So wrote Portia Catalog Gage on March 12th, 1868 in Vineland, New Jersey, after she bravely went to the polls in order to vote and was simply told because she was not registered, she could not. The name Portia Kellogg Gage has probably been eclipsed by some other well-known suffragettes like Alice Paul, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and Susan B. Anthony. Yet she was a forerunner of women who dared to go to the polls to try to cast their votes and she hails from the great state of New Jersey. She was so daring, so bold, that she tried to cast her vote at a time when women did not have that right. Let me pose to you a question, one that you don't have to answer out loud. How many of us don't go out on election day? How many of us take that right for granted? I'm asking a serious question here and I want you to think about your answer. Some can't be bothered or others think that their vote won't count. How many of us just don't wanna take the time because it's primary day or because it's just a local election? I'm sure many will remember how excited we were on October 9th of 2004 when we witnessed Afghani women risking their lives to go to the polls, fearing for their very lives from repercussions of the Taliban, yet proudly showing their ink-stained fingers as proof that they voted. Their struggle was real. Our struggle here in the United States was very real too. That privilege of voting that all women now enjoy in America is sometimes forgotten. Yet many years ago, the ability to go to the polls to cast one's vote was a right that eluded women. Interestingly enough, though, that wasn't always the case. 245 years ago, women had the right to vote in only one state. Yep, New Jersey. A right they would soon lose 
in 1807. The New Jersey State Constitution, as written in 1776, allowed both free African Americans and women to vote so long as they owned property valued at 50 pounds. The wording was then modified in 1790 when the law specifically stated he or she, making it very clear that men and women could vote. It should be of note, though, that only unmarried women had that right, since a married woman was denied the privilege of property ownership. Let me also mention that African Americans who fit the state's criteria could vote as well, until 1797, when it was clarified that you had to be a free resident in order to vote. Maybe it was an oversight. Maybe it was intentional. But for 31 years, any female who fit the said criteria in New Jersey could vote, and many did. This was so profound and astonishing that the first lady of the United States, Abigail Adams, acknowledged the importance of women being able to vote, that she wrote in a letter to her sister asking her to convey a message to a Massachusetts candidate who had recently lost an election and wanted her to tell him that if that state's constitution, quote, had been equally liberal with that of New Jersey and admitted females to vote, I should certainly have exercised it in his behalf. New Jersey women continued to vote as long as they could. As Alice Paul later wrote about this, she said, quote, women voted, yet no catastrophe, social or political, ensued, end quote. And they did vote until political scandals took place in a few county elections, like Essex and Hunterdon, with allegations of voter fraud, married women voting, and the fact that there were more votes cast than people who actually resided in those counties. Here, the opportunity presented itself, and women were easy to implicate. At the root of this was the assumption that most women voted Federalist, and the Democratic Republicans controlled the state government. So the logical thing to do was to reduce the number of people voting for the Federalist Party. And in 1807, the state legislature decided to change the law, then limiting the vote to free white males. I ask you once again to pause and think about it, imagining having the right to vote and then losing it. But the incentive was there for women to continue to push for their right to vote, deriving inspiration from the female members of the Haudenosaunee Confederation, also known as the Iroquois, who were led by clan mothers. The women of the 19th century found strength in the fact that men and women were equals and embraced that they shared these rights together. At a pivotal moment in American history at Seneca Falls, New York, through the efforts of women like Lucretia Mott, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Martha Wright, Mary McClintock, Jane Hunt, a convention was held to discuss quote unquote civil, social, civil, and religious condition and rights of women. On July 19th, 1848, this momentous two-day event began. The first day was only for women. Men were allowed on the second day. And the fight for suffrage was underway. One of the most significant accomplishments of this amazing conference was the Declaration of Sentiments, which set the tenor for the women's right movement most importantly, suffrage. The document was signed, and this is the table where it was written, the document was signed by 68 women and 32 men, inclusive of Frederick 
Douglas, who used his newspapers to help advocate on behalf of the women's right to vote. The work began and it could just continue to prosper. Though limited in many spheres of life, women were engaged in a variety of activities and movements like abolition, temperance, and suffrage. When normally their voice was denied, here they had a say. There were countless people who worked on behalf of abolition of slavery, something that of course would take a war to finally attain. We tend to think in history as 1968 being a very pivotal year in American history, but I ask you to go back 100 years before. There were countless significant changes as well as agitations in the American political system. As women worked tirelessly for abolition, we'll see that, of course, the 13th Amendment came about in 1865. They vex, then moved next to help get African Americans the right of citizenship. When the 14th Amendment was ratified, which, quote, all persons uh, born or naturalized in the United States, included, inclusive of former slaves, were granted citizenship. As women then next argued for suffrage for African American men, they assumed they'd be included. In the interim, while this was all going on in that pivotal year of, 19, of 1868, the aforementioned Portia Kellogg Gage had attempted to vote in local elections in Vineland, New Jersey. Others then tried in Passaic. And then when it came time for the federal elections on November 3rd of 1868, 172 women proudly walked into Union Hall in Vineland, New Jersey. When they were refused, they simply proceeded to come back in with a blueberry crate that they turned into a ballot box and set up their own table. Of those women that voted, 168 voted for Ulysses Grant, four for Horatio Seymour. Of this action, Susan B. Anthony wrote, quote, Vineland women were, did splendidly on election day and will no doubt continue to do the same. So send us all the good words, end quote. It was also at the end of 1868 that Kansas Senator Samuel Clark Pomeroy introduced the Woman's Suffrage Amendment, one that was rejected. But the specific wording that was used in this amendment would not disappear, and it would be seen again. When the 15th Amendment was presented to Congress, voted upon and ratified, women were not included. They felt that they had been slighted once again. Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony were outraged. They felt they had been betrayed, that voting rights were not given to women. Just to let you know, all this did was further encourage women. As a matter of fact, 858 women in New Jersey tried to vote after the ratification of the 15th Amendment. The following year, 1869, in Wyoming, the territorial governor had the foresight to grant white women voting rights, something that was denied them in other states and territories. But what is interesting is that the motives weren't 100% pure. At this point, the territory was primarily populated by men, and they wanted to draw more unmarried women out there to settle. Although it was not the sole motivation of this legislation, it was one sure way to entice women to move to Wyoming. There were almost 1,000 women 
eligible to vote in Wyoming in 1870. Most of them did. And just of note, this is why Wyoming is called the Equality State. But then in 1871, a relatively unknown woman, she was uneducated. She was the mother to a mentally disabled child. She was granted audience before the House Judiciary Committee. It was here that she asserted that women had the right under the 14th and 15th Amendments. In this speech, which was helped write in, written by, excuse me, Massachusetts Representative Benjamin Butler, Woodhall stated, quote, that the citizen who is taxed should also have a voice in the subject matter of taxation, end quote. Then one year later, 1872, the National Radical Reformers Equal Rights Party nominated her the first woman officially to be running for president. What's thought to be more of a symbolic move, Frederick Douglass was nominated as the vice presidential candidate, and no one really knows if he even accepted this. It's really interesting. Susan B. Anthony didn't support Woodhull's nomination, but Elizabeth Cady Stanton did. Women didn't have the right to vote, and Woodhull's name didn't even appear on the official ballot. But it was a historic moment and a positive step in the right direction. Susan B. Anthony, along with 14 others, tried to go to the polling place in Rochester, New York, after convincing officials to allow them to do so Anthony voted for the Republicans on the ballot, inclusive of President Grant. Days later, Susan B. Anthony was arrested. She actually was given an option, but she demanded that she be arrested for violating Section 8 of the Enforcement Act of 1870. As the case drew to a conclusion, Judge Ward Hart, Hunt excuse me, ruled that the 15th Amendment gave African-American men the right to vote, not women, and emphasized that Susan B. Anthony was of sound mind, knowing fully well that she did not have that right. She was fined $100, something that really wasn't pursued. But Anthony remained defiant, and she would not pay. After the ruling, she proclaimed, quote, the only chance women have for justice in this country is to violate the law, as I have done and shall continue to do. This struck a chord, and Virginia Minor of Missouri tr was refused when she tried to register to vote. This case would make it all the way to the Supreme Court. The court ruled very simply that she could not, and I won't go into all the details as a matter of a time. Although the suffragists were beaten, they were not defeated. The case just further bolstered their desire and gave them impetus to try new tactics. A constitutional amendment was a must. Republican Senator Aaron Sargent of California heard their call and introduced the women's suffrage amendment in 1878 also known as the Susan B. Anthony Amendment. This was followed by suffragists actually arguing before Congress on its behalf. But again, this was defeated. The fight would continue. S Elizabeth Cady Stanton believed in what she had said at Seneca Falls. She felt since she paid taxes in New Jersey and she resided in Tenafly, New Jersey, November 2nd, 1880, she left her house, accompanied by her dear friend, Susan B. Anthony, and they went to the Valley Hotel to cast their vote. Arriving at the polling place, an exchange took place where she provided an articulate explanation as to why she could vote, referencing the historical precedents in New Jersey that women could at one time vote. She received a response of, quote, 
I know nothing about the constitutions, state or national. I have never read either. But I do know that in New Jersey, women have not voted in my day, and I cannot accept your ballot, end quote. Clearly, she did not get to vote. In an unparalleled action in 1884, women tried to again make their mark. The National Equal Rights Party nominated Belva Lockwood and Marietta Stowe. They were the first women to officially appear on the ballot. And still, women didn't have the right to vote. Belva Lockwood didn't carry any electoral votes, but there were many women just beaming with pride, knowing that she was on the ballot, one they were still unable to see. By 1890, the two largest suffrage organizations merged together, creating the National American Women's Suffrage Association with Elizabeth Cady Stanton at the helm. They took the approach of going state by state in order to get an amendment for suffrage. Times were changing. In Colorado, women could actually vote in 1893. With the advent of the progressive movement, we'll see that suffragists started to gain momentum. In fact, in 1912, the Bull Moose Party, under the helm of former President Theodore Roosevelt, became the first major political party to stand on behalf of women getting the right to vote. The following year was the famous woman's suffrage procession down Pennsylvania Avenue, the first woman's rally in Washington, D.C. They called upon the people marching in the parade to, quote, march in a spirit of protest against the present political organization of society from which women are excluded, end quote. While women were drawing attention to their fight, an unprecedented event happened. Jeanette Rankin, of Man Montana, a Republican, became the first woman elected to Congress in November of 1916. And again, women didn't have the right to vote. She proudly asserted that, quote, I may be the first woman member of Congress, but I won't be the last, end quote. Just of note, the Anaconda Copper Company, which was the largest company in Montana who happened to own all the newspapers, decided not to publish that Jeanette Rankin had been elected to Congress. The world was changing, war was raging in Europe, and society was changing as a whole. Suffragists were pushing and pushing for a constitutional amendment. They were receiving brutal treatment in return. On every front, women were being spit upon or having th things thrown at them. In fact, they were being treated even more brutally behind prison doors. Many instances, they were being beaten inside the prisons. They were also being strapped down and being force fed to end their hunger strikes. Back when President Wilson was a professor at Bryn Mawr, he felt it was beneath him to teach women students. Therefore, he did not think women really should have the right to vote. His wife, Edith, concurred with him, which is kind of interesting because she was a really independent woman. But times were changing. More and more across America, people were starting to support the suffrage movement. Violence towards women further encouraged people to get this amendment to action. Alice Paul made the horrors public, one that was tough for people to bear, that when she was arrested in the midst of her hunger strike, she was strapped down. They stuck tubes up her nose in order to force feed her, something that medically she never recovered. And, and by the way, 
they also put her in the mental ward. Another front that helped draw American support for the women's suffrage amendment was the fact that we had entered the Great War. Women were taking the place of men in jobs, freeing them to go make the world safe for democracy. President Wilson was being pushed, and his daughter, Jessie Wilson Sayre, was right there to guide her father. Congressional leaders in 1917 were consumed with the issues of the American Expeditionary Forces and what was happening with them in Europe. It seemed as though the tenor of the Senate regarding the issue of suffrage seemed to temper in the wake of our entry into the war. In fact, one stated, quote, if the president wants the amendment to pass, we will vote for it, end quote. New York, 1917, granted women the right to vote. Protests in the nation's capital intensified, and the news avidly reported about these abuses, ones like Alice Paul had talked about. Americans were horrified as to this. Representative Jeanette Rankin made a very bold move and opened the discussion about suffrage in the House of Representatives. She soon found that she was not standing alone. Although President Wilson had felt the issues of the war took precedence, the question of women's right had to be addressed. In a historic moment with the encouragement of his daughter, Jesse, on September 30th, 1918, the President of the United States stood on the floor of the Senate. He proclaimed, quote, we have made partners of women in this war. Shall we admit them only to a partnership of suffering and sacrifice and toil and not to a partnership of privilege and right? The next day, the vote took place, 53 to 31 for the Susan B. Anthony Amendment. It was technically three short of being passed. Alice Paul was certain this wasn't the end. She stated the defeat is only temporary. Our efforts to secure the reversal will begin at once, end quote. Politics in America are ever-changing. The outcome of the 1918 midterm elections reflected disdain for those who lacked the support of the amendment. And this amendment was finally brought back before Congress. Finally, on May 21st, 1919, the House of Representatives passed the amendment. Then Americans patiently waited to see what would happen in the Senate after two previous failed attempts. Two weeks later, on June 4th, 1919, the Senate passed the amendment. The battle had been won to an extent. The 19th Amendment now had to be ratified. In just six days, Wisconsin and Michigan ratified the amendment. But it would take time to get the necessary votes the three-quarters threshold. 35 states had ratified the amendment, and it just seemed like everything paused. Tennessee fell to the limelight. Other potential states like Connecticut, Vermont, North Carolina, and Florida, for many reasons, just weren't going to vote. Others had already rejected it. Now, perhaps stories have been sensationalized, and perhaps they are true. But like I always tell my students in class, you got to love a good story. The events in Tennessee and what, are, what is known as the War of the Roses, because those in favor of the amendment wore a yellow rose and those against it wore a red rose. The youngest state senator, Harry Byrne, 24 years old, continued to wear his red rose rose, even though countless suffragettes 
pushed him and tried to get him to change his mind. The boat was deadlocked. On August 18, 1919, everyone waited to see what would happen. Senator Byrne, who was proudly sporting his red robes, when his name was called, he was clutching a letter in his hand. This is the envelope, and this is the letter from his mom, Feb Byrne. She had written her son stating simply, hurry and vote for suffrage and don't keep them in doubt. I noticed the Chandler's speech. It was very bitter and I've been waiting to see how you stood but have not yet seen. Don't forget to be a good boy and help Mrs. Cat with her rats. Is she the one that put the rat in ratification? Ha, no more from mama this time with lots of love, mom. Clutching this letter in his hand, Senator Byrne confidently stated, I. He heeded his mother's advice and with this guidance, the 19th Amendment was adopted. Key suffragettes stood around President Wilson as he affixed his signature, August 26, 1920, although it wouldn't be until the passage of the Voting Rights Act in 1965 that all women were granted the right, our voices were finally heard. So in closing, I want to ask you just once again, how many people can't be bothered to go to vote? Next time this crosses your mind, remember the stories that I told you. Think about what suffragist Abigail Scott Dunaway, who sadly did not live to see the passage of the 19th Amendment, when she said, quote, the young women of today, free to study, to speak, to write, to choose their occupation, should remember that every inch of this freedom was bought for them at a great price. It is for them to show their gratitude by helping onward the reforms of their own times, by spreading the light of freedom and of truth still wider. The debt that each generation owes to the past, it must pay to the future. Thank you. Absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. We have a small gift from the 100 Women's Scholarship oh, Project so for you. Thank and you. so you can remember us. And I know you're going to remember the 19th Amendment. Absolutely. Thank you so much Thank for the time so that much, you spent. Thank you so much, Judge Parker. Thank you. I'm truly, truly honored. Thank you. Thank you, Judge Parker, for um, donating these wonderful 19th Amendment mugs for us to use as a door prize today. Uh, we did a drawing uh, behind the scenes here. And our winners of these mugs are Jessica Eichner, an alumni of SCCC, Dr. Paul Crowley from our Board of Trustees, and Mr. Roger Thomas from our Foundation Board. So thank you all for your support. And um, we are still asking people to submit questions, and we are about to start our question and answer session. So our first question is, women's suffrage led to the 19th Amendment in 1920, Temperance led to the prohibition in the 18th Amendment in 1919. Was there a crossover between those groups? In their work, um, women, as I kind of briefly mentioned, I'm sorry I didn't get to go in as in much detail, but you saw that um, women had a voice, first in abolition, particularly in temperance, and then with uh, voting and suffrage. And you see that women actively worked for all of these. One thing to note, like for example, and I made a lot of reference to New Jersey mostly because that's where we are, but voting took place back in the 18th century in taverns. 
And so there was fear that people were drinking when they were going to vote, just side note for you. And that's why actually some states still have laws that the bars are closed on election day so that people don't get drunk and then go vote. And so in many ways, these movements to get these amendments passed did tie together. And particularly in the wake of what was happening um, in the uh, early 1900s in our industrial era, that they were seeing more problems with alcoholism. But there were movements for women to help get rid of the abuses of alcohol as well as the right to vote. And so there were a lot of women that worked tirelessly together for both of these movements, but they were tied together also. I hope that answers your question. Great, the next question is in, pre in preparing for today, did you come across any stories about Sussex County women and their fight for the right to vote? So there are a few that I came across and actually very nicely last year when I was doing the talk, I had been emailed a few stories. Um, I, you know, it was so hard to put this together. And um, that's something I can, I'll do that some other time. We'll do about Suffolk, Sussex County women specifically uh, and their work for suffrage. Great. So the next question is, who are three influential women within the last 50 years that we can research? Oh, gosh. Do you want them in just America or just, <laughs> uh, that, that's a tough, well, I think we can one, and this isn't just because Judge Parker's here, but very simply, I think you always have to look at Sandra Day O'Connor and Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Um, they were just absolute role models and trendsetters. Um, I can even tell you, I remember I was a very little girl when Sandra Day O'Connor was appointed to the Supreme Court and my dad said, see Heidi, if there isn't any further proof you can do anything, you're witnessing history right at this moment. Um, I, oh gosh, there's so many women that you could really look at. I would even say Margaret Thatcher too, if, we were, if we're going worldwide. Um, I could probably list about 150. It was kind of like when Judge Parker asked me questions and she wanted one answer and I gave her about 15 for everything. <laughs> but I, those would be three I'd start with. Great, so we only have one more question. Okay. Um, that is, did the suffrage movement in the U.S. coincide with any other movements such as you're in Europe? Okay, absolutely. In Great Britain, there was a lot of great influence. And if you start, you know, if you just do like a general Google search, some of the, you'll see women being arrested in Britain um, and sit very similar pictures. Um, it, you know, we'll see them being thrown on the ground. You'll see them, you know, having water thrown at them. And so you do start to see these movements taking place. There, there was a lot of parallel uh, in Europe and in the United States. Europe had the disadvantage and then the advantage of the fact that they had the war being fought there. And you start to see women getting a lot more liberties and rights as a result, because the men primarily were off fighting. Although I shouldn't discount Russian women were actually fighting in combat. Great, that's all of our questions. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Weber, for your fantastic presentation today. Uh, as some of you may know, this lecture was originally scheduled for March of 2020 to coincide with the 100th anniversary of the passage of the 19th Amendment. Unfortunately, that uh, lecture was canceled shortly before the event due to the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. Although the format and the venue may have changed Dr. Weber, your remarks were well worth the wait. Dr. Weber, on behalf of the foundation, we thank you and extend an open invitation to campus. This lecture is being filmed today and will be a valuable resource for our campus community and for our students and for the community of Sussex County. Christina Miller, received one of the first 100 Women Project Scholarships in 2015. Today, she is studying for her doctorate in nursing practice. I'd like to share with you a video message 
that Christina sent to us on behalf of this event. My name is Christina Miller, and I was the first recipient of the 100 Women's Scholarship Award. This was the first of many scholarships I received during my time at Sussex County Community College. As a young girl, I always dreamed that I would go to college and have a career where I could help people. However, to say my journey was difficult is an understatement. Attending college seemed impossible. However, the only thing stronger than my fear of going to college were my aspirations. And at the age of 24, I decided to take a leap of faith. I worked full time as a server while taking the nursing school prerequisites. At the age of 27, I earned a seat in the nursing program. Altogether, I spent four years at Sussex County Community College. And with the help of scholarships and grants, I finished my associate's degree in nursing and an RN license completely debt free. During my time at Sussex County Community College, I volunteered to be a peer tutor for anatomy and physiology and was the president of the anatomy club. By the time I finished the nursing program, I was awarded both the Academic Achievement Award and the Nurse Education Service Award. I went on to earn my bachelor's degree in nursing the following year. Currently, I am attending Misericordia University in Dallas, Pennsylvania in pursuit of my Doctor of Nursing practice with a focus in family nurse practitioner. When I think back to the woman I was when I began my academic journey, I can't help but remember the day I received the 100 Women's Scholarship. It was my first semester at Sussex County Community College and the first scholarship I ever received. Of course, the scholarship helped significantly with the financial burden, but the scholarships I received were, were worth far more than the monetary value. The scholarships reminded me that there were people in this community who believed in me, who wanted me to succeed, and who selflessly invested in my future. When I first applied for the scholarship, I was not very optimistic. I had an attitude of, why would they choose me? With each scholarship I received, my support system and confidence grew, and I finally started to say, why not me? I hope my story reminds every one of you that when you give a student a scholarship, you are giving them far more than financial assistance. You are giving them a fighting chance at a dream that may not have been possible without you. There are people out there that are people of changing the world. They just need to have the opportunity to do it. So when you want to put a face to the scholarship you donate to, I hope you think of me. I hope you think of the lives I have been able to impact because of the impact you've had on mine. With the sincerest gratitude, thank you. Thank you so much, Christina. Thank you so much, Christina. As you can see, the 100 Women Project Endowed Scholarships make a real difference in the lives of our students. Christina, you make us all proud, and we look forward to hearing of your achievements in the future. At this time, I'd like to thank the 100 Women Project Steering Committee. Of course, Judge Lorraine Parker, the 100 Women Project founder, and Sussex County Community College Foundation Board of Directors. Lee Ellison, Karen Ann Quinlis Hospice. Mary Ann Fox, Sussex County Community College Trustee and Foundation Board of Directors. Jamie Lacatour, Thor Labs, and the Sussex County Community College Foundation Board. And finally, Robin Tomlinson of Provident Bank. Of course, a special thanks to Christine Trucio, our Foundation Assistant, and our Media Services Assistant, Tim O'Connor, for making this virtual event a reality. So far this year, we've raised $5,975 from 45 supporters for the 100 Women Project Endowed Scholarship. So once again, if you'd like to support the scholarship, please go to www.sussex.edu slash 100 women to make your donation if you haven't done so already. In closing, the foundation is proud to bring the needs of Sussex County Community College together with the initiatives, needs, and passion of our community. And so, if you have an interest in making a real difference for supporting student success academic support, faculty and staff support, or innovation right here in Sussex County, please contact the foundation office and let's start a conversation. 
of how you could make a change that will change the world.